This is Tony Saudor's 53. And before we get on with the podcast, there are a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, if you listen to this podcast, and you clearly do listening to this podcast, could you please do me a favor and head on to Tommy Outdoors profile page on an app or website that you're using for listening to this podcast. And so find Tommy Outdoors profile page there and rate the podcast. Five stars would be ideal. And if you want to do a little bit extra more, please leave the review. This is a great help for the podcast and for me. So that's number one. Number two, you can do something for yourself. Head on to YouTube, pop in Tommy's Outdoors into that search box and subscribe to Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel. There is a lot of uh, videos there already, but much more is coming. On top of that, I am uploading every episode of the podcast to YouTube as well. So on YouTube, you can enjoy full Tommy's Outdoors experience, both podcasts and videos. Okay, so that's it for housekeeping. And now let's get on with the podcast. Our guest today is Eleanor Turner from Sea Synergy Marine Awareness Center in Waterville. And Ellie was our guest already in episode 17. And we spoke about Sea Synergy, what they do, all the events and all the great stuff that you can avail and book with Sea Synergy. And that was over one year ago. And that year ago, a month or two months later, after we've done recording the podcast, Ellie invited me to a education event called Ivora Learning Landscapes. And what a great event that was. Uh, I get to meet a lot of great people, attended a lot of fantastic workshops. I get hang out with, with many, many brilliant people. And as a result of that, I invited many of them to the podcast. So for example, sailing legend Damian Foxall in episode 27. On episode 29, uh, I was talking with Kieran Nungent about native woodlands in Ireland. Brilliant episode, number 29. And episode 32, Madeleine Weber and Greg McNamara. Outdoors photography and recording of nature sounds. Great episode. Again, I met them both on Ivora Learning Landscapes. Episode 33, Game Management with Aaron Turner. I met Aaron for the first time on Ivora Learning Landscapes as well. So it was very successful and a great event. So a few weeks ago, I learned that another edition of Ivora Learning Landscapes is taking place. And obviously, I had to get involved. So we're doing a couple of other things related to that event with Ellie. But about that, maybe later. But the first order of business was to get with Ellie and sit down and record a podcast specifically dedicated to Ivora Learning Landscapes. 2019 edition, but in general, we talk about what Ivora Learning Landscapes is, what you can expect, and all the things around it, how it started, etc., etc. And on top of that, what a great conversation was that. We, we sat down with Ellie in Sea Synergy offices, and we just chatted away, and we laughed, and we had a great time. So check out everybody, Ivora Learning Landscapes. If you want tickets, go to eventbrite.ie, pop in Ivora Learning Landscapes, and you can buy your tickets. Also, I put the link to Eventbrite in the description of this podcast, so you can go there and get yourself tickets. Um, but for now, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Eleanor Turner and Ivora Learning Landscapes. What's going on, Ellie? Not much. Now I've had a pretty easy day today, Tommy. Oh, very good. Very <laughs> good. It's almost one year uh, since you've been on the podcast. So welcome back to the show. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I think after the last one, I, I didn't didn't see myself in the future doing another one, I have to say. 
<laughs> oh, why? It's it's not my favorite thing to be recorded and to listen to myself afterwards. So. <laughs> yeah, we were just having a chat about that. That this all like, what what am I I supposed to say? Like this is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm on yeah. every single one of. I need episodes. a list of questions so I can be prepared. <laughs> I'll just be making stuff up otherwise. <laughs> no, no. Well, so last time we just, we were spoke we were talking about C synergy and we're in a C synergy office. Yeah, so we're we're in C Synergy main building at the moment, our exhibition yeah. center. So we're sitting in the shop, although we're closed now because it's a uh, late yeah. in the evening. So in Waterville, in County Waterville, Kerry, the most southern western part of the country, yeah, the tippy tip of the tippy tip of the <laughs> peninsula. Yeah, <laughs> does that does that impact the business or or what or, or what you're doing, or is it like? advantage really because of the location I, I think our location for C synergy is definitely an advantage um i think when you look at the area we're very the, the industry here is very based around tourism so we have a huge amount of traffic coming through every year yeah uh the wild atlantic way the ring of Kerry, two major driving routes so yeah. we have a lot of people coming through but outside of the sort of the day trippers or the people just doing the driving routes there is a there's sort of a long-standing um, industry of, of people having a second home or renting a holiday home for two or three mm. weeks in the summer. So there's a huge amount of people that come to us on a return basis. So they come every year to do workshops or mm -hmm. activities and their families have maybe been coming to Waterville or Cara Daniel for, you know, a yeah. couple of generations, really. So ah. it's it's a pretty nice spot to have the business. And of course, the landscape here, like ah. you really can't beat it. So ah. it, <laughs> I like, wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I, well, even if it's if it's rainy day and cloudy day, it's still beautiful. Yeah, it's, it it's, is. It's, 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 there is still. It's not like you know because like oh, there's a sunshine and and blue skies and blue sea. That's beautiful. But even if the weather like today, where there's the rain and clouds and fog, it is it is beautiful as well in a way because of the ruggedness of the landscape. Absolutely, like, I think I think the the weather and how it changes here even adds something more to the landscape. If we had mm -hmm. sort of perfect sunny days every day, um, it's amazing. It's great to lie out in the sun. Everyone loves that, but they can start to feel a little monotonous, I think. And so mm. having that extra element to things that you're planning, like, okay, what's the weather going to be like? And maybe we need a plan B or mm -hmm. what gear do we have? Do we have the right gear? It it brings a whole new dimension to doing outdoor activities and outdoor education trips. And so it does yeah. make it a little bit more exciting. Yeah. And the, there's a lot, of ex a lot of experiences I've had where the weather, has, we've sort of started out thinking, oh God, th this is pretty bad weather. Maybe we shouldn't be doing it mm -hmm. and ended up, having just a really beautiful amazing experience at the end of the day like yes. like one example this summer we went out and we started a, a stand-up paddle boarding trip and it was mm -hmm. going to run for two hours and I was looking at the clouds thinking oh we might not get the two hours of good weather out of this like the the clouds were coming in over the the mountain at the back of the lake and I was thinking we're going to get a pretty heavy rain shower mm -hmm. before the end of the day but we got everyone into the wetsuits and out on the lake. And sure, by that time, they're already wet, so they didn't really mind. And the, <laughs> the heavens opened around us. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of thinking, OK, if we manage to paddle down here and then we'll do a little activity and then we might just cut it a little bit short if people aren't enjoying it and getting cold. And I turned around to sort of like gauge the reaction of the people I was with. And one of the women was just sort of standing there on her board with her arms wide open, just being like, this is so beautiful. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> just because the, the it was so still and the rain was mm. just coming straight down, really heavy raindrops mm -hmm. and just the sound of it on the lake and bouncing off yes. the board in front of you. And they were, it was magical really. And, yeah. and they were swept away by it. They didn't want to leave. You know, they wanted to stay out longer in the rain. Whereas well. initially I was going, oh gee, okay, let's get, <laughs> let's get in off the lake before we all get hypothermia. But, <laughs> but they, were, they were people like, uh, you know, city dwellers kind of thing? Or um, Yeah, I think they were, I can't oh. remember exactly, but I, I think they were from Cork. So, yeah. so of course, I know myself, you know, because I, I'm, I'm I spent like 30 years in a in a city, 20, you know, and it's it's just this kind this like oh it doesn't matter, it's rainy, whatever. You you kind of ex absorbing the nature and you absorbing it. So I, I'm I'm not surprised at all. So you're doing now so as you sub tours, sub tours, sub -tours. Yeah. stand stand up paddle boarding or sub for sure. Have you heard about uh, this this girl Una Una Tibbets? She's uh, paddle boarding, stand up paddle boarding, I, I suppose to say, uh, along uh, Wild Atlantic Way. Yeah, yeah. So she I passed, had her on the podcast. She passed Southwest Kerry um, yeah. during the summer. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty amazing to paddle board that far. Yeah. But I don't think she's going to complete that this year. 
I, I think she will take kind she of she's like, taking her time well yeah. honestly it would, <laughs> if I was going to do a trip like that I'd sure want to take my time <laughs> yeah I, I had it on their on their podcast and there was like a lot of a lot of kind of weather coming because you know like when you stand there paddle boarding on the lake it's it's very weather dependent it's, it's yeah, different it's, well it's while she's doing that at the sea yeah. Well, the tide, the swell, uh, it's like whoa. absolutely. It's, it's, like, Una, it's oh, definitely not like, as stable you, as a as be yeah. sitting in a kayak or something. Like yeah, like yeah. to get the paddle boards out on the lake, even for beginner lessons, we need you know less than twelve knots of wind, so we need pretty calm yeah, days yeah. to get people started. And then uh, we don't run level two workshops yet. Level two would be sort of like out in the bay here in Balanskelegs. We're hoping uh-huh. to start them next year. Wow. But that's a whole like second qualification that you need to get as an instructor mm. to be able to deliver those workshops. Wow. So yeah, there there's there's a lot more to think about being on a paddleboard on the sea than there is being on a nice flat lake. So <laughs> well I would like paddleboard to me, you know, when I think about paddleboard, I see like a flats in Florida Keys, you know, hot, like the water is like a maybe ankle deep maybe knee deep and you're kind of <laughs> pushing yourself on the paddle board <laughs> so like whoa think, are we doing that at <laughs> sea I, I think that's probably everyone's first impression of what paddle mm-hmm. boarding is but to be honest when you're when you're that shallow you should really be on your knees just for safety reasons so mm. it's much better to be on deeper water on a paddle board really? so yeah and uh we've been out a few times like we've taken trips with um like the the intern crew that we had this mm-hmm. year and gone out to Carrigaynon the rock that's just uh, in the middle of the bay here where the seals haul up to rest at low tide right. and the water is just perfectly clear and you're you're paddling over like a kelp forest and mm-hmm. you're, you can see straight down through the water at everything underneath you you know like we saw dogfish coming past the seals came up to say hi it was it was amazing right. yeah yeah definitely and because you have that perspective of standing on the water it's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. it's it's really unusual i suppose and and yeah, yeah it's, it's really amazing perspective to wow have. so that's something new that you 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 the last time we spoke you you guys hasn't been doing this this no it's so we thing. started these i think we spoke july last year yeah and it was sort of late july that we started offering them so we had just completed the instructor courses in june with mm-hmm. paul byrne from asi sup in He's based in Dublin. Mm-hmm. Um, I nearly forgot where he was based then. He'll be mm-hmm. very un- unimpressed with me at that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he came down, he delivered the instructor workshops. I think it was like the last week in June. Right. And we literally just got all the gear then and got started in July. So when I spoke to you, mm-hmm. I was in the middle of teaching a continuous professional development course for primary school teachers mm-hmm. for the Explorers Education Programme. Um, and when I got back then from Trilly that week, was straight into wow. <laughs> delivering the lessons on the lake. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so come on, plug in how people can uh, uh, afford this and... How, how they can get yeah, into, yeah, into yeah. stand-up paddleboarding. Yeah, okay, just, just the easiest way in. is to come along to... We're an ASI registered school, which means that we abide by the standards of the ASI. Um And so you book in a lesson, come and join us on the lake for a couple of hours. We give you like the basic introduction to the board, how to use the board, how to use the Mm. paddle, how to get your balance and and how to paddle correctly on the board so that you're putting less strain on your body. Um, And then we take a spin around the lake as well. So you see some of the amazing views and and we get to play a few games and things like that. Uh, And then, you know, if you get hooked and you're interested, there's really affordable um, inflatable subs that you can get at the moment. Oh, wow. Yeah. Or if you're or if you're really into it, you can start getting into the hard boards and sup surfing. And there's so much all around the stand up paddle boarding that you can do. It's really amazing. Oh, yeah. pretty good. So there's, there's people just need to look up Sea Synergy Waterville. Just, yeah, it's all on the website. Check out seasynergy.org. And it's very simple to follow through the website then and find the tours that we offer. Wow. So we do kayaking as well. If you're not as confident, you don't really want to try standing up on the board. You can uh-huh. take a kayak out and get the same experience. Wow. And is it going on like throughout, throughout the kind of autumn and winter months as well? Any Weather fine day. Weather depending. <laughs> yeah, any fine day is the provision really from here on. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if it's calm enough and the conditions are right and someone wants to go out, we'll take them out for sure. Wow. Yeah. This so, is great. Yeah. So, yeah, and if you don't like the cold. <laughs> you, you, you know, this, uh, this is this is one of the things I, I like about these plays is, is like a, people, I mean, like in general, this part of Ireland, or maybe Ireland in general, 
if you guys feel so relaxed and so kind of light back like yeah come on come along we go you know uh, like in my head is like oh there's a schedule and there's a slots and you need to fit and it's like no we just like come on we have to be we have to be a little bit more scheduled in the summer but we're Mm -hmm. a little busier then so like like for an example in a week in the summer we could have three seashore safaris Mm -hmm. uh, a sea camp running for six to twelve year olds we can have two to three paddleboard or kayak sessions Mm -hmm. a day we have a sup fit class that runs on a monday morning we have a sup and stretch that we do on a sunday we have mindfulness walks on a wednesday um wow. we do exhibition tours uh on demand in the center so we had a team of up to eight interns this year and two full-time employees for the summer months so there's a lot of different moving parts and it's, oh snorkel tours i forgot to mention the snorkel tours we do those it feels as well. to me like you you guys grew over over last year yeah we it's did so more. we with the the activities on the lake it sort of required a bigger team really mm-hmm. to facilitate that so we started taking on a couple more interns um we also got into taking on a marketing intern which was a great opportunity for marketing students to mm-hmm. engage in kind of meaningful marketing and get a bit of experience during their yes. their summers off from the course they're doing um we had a really amazing girl called ashling this year mm-hmm. who's from america we had a lot of fun actually working with her mm-hmm. um so yeah, we have the marketing intern. We took on uh, an operations. Shout out to assistant. Ashlyn if you. Sh- yeah, to that. shout out to Ashlyn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll tag her in this on Facebook there when it comes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's working with us on uh, the Rural Learning Landscapes Weekend that comes mm-hmm. up as well. So big shout out to Ashlyn for all the help she's giving us with that. Um, but yeah, so the team in the summer really grew from from two years ago. Last year we had mm-hmm. two full time employees during the summer as well. Um, and a team of interns but this year the team of interns got bigger so we incorporated a lot more stuff like uh we started doing citizen science saturdays as well so a few of the girls who were experienced in doing surveys on seabirds or rock pool Mm -hmm. surveys would take members of the public down and just sort of start engaging them in how to record biodiversity in a meaningful way to deliver data to citizen science programs so Yeah, there was there was a lot a lot going on, which was oh, <laughs> it was really whoa. exciting. Yeah, we had well done. We had an amazing team actually. It wouldn't work at all without the the team mm. that we had. It was it was really fantastic. They're a really good group of girls, really good at working together and everything. It's so. always a team, right? It's oh, always, absolutely. It's always a like, team. Yeah, I think I think it's like about two to two and a half percent me making the schedule work and the rest of it is them just You're being just lying amazing the foundation <laughs> yeah. just lying the foundation they just know which time to arrive and which time to leave <laughs> and then in between that they just worked amazingly <laughs> oh that's that's yeah. that's great that's a, that's always the you know recipe for success so it's it's very uh seasonal right in the season it's, it just picks up and and there's a lot of so the the season really kicks off for us sort of towards the end of June. I think it's really dependent on the the school kids and their holidays. I think uh-huh. if the school kids had longer holidays, we'd have a longer season. Because wow. uh, a lot of our stuff is family orientated and we do take a lot of like individuals and couples as well. But certainly the summer stuff with the, the seashore safaris and the sea camps, that's mm-hmm. all sort of six to 12 year olds. So mm. it's very dependent on the, the school holidays then. Um, we're noticing a lot in the shoulder season as well um, that that's starting to increase for us for sure and it, the the extra activities like the paddle boarding and the kayaking have increased again the season kind of stretching it out a little bit for us wow <clears throat> and so there is I presume obviously as a as a business owners it's not like an annoyance in any way but the reason I'm, I'm asking about that I I had a on a on a podcast a, a guy he lives not far from here Kevin Murphy and he has this idea of uh, of the uh, monorail train, solar powered, just to get rid of the buses and get rid of the, all the traffic on the Ring of Kerry because it's it's kind of annoying. And uh, and I kind kind of under, can understand that because when you're cycling and in the in the in in peak of a season and you have all these buses and all that, it's it's yeah. it's not fun. Is that a little bit of a mixed bag for you guys here? Like I, on one I, end, it's like bringing <laughs> on, bringing on. The more, the me- the better. But is there is there this other side as well? It's like, well, yeah, but then it's like too busy. Yeah, I think it, it's definitely a mis- mixed bag. And I think for, for me personally as well, I sort of have the perspective of someone who works for a business that is dependent on tourism. 
and then someone who works in an area that has a lot of tourism you know so mm. for example in the summertime <laughs> I've got to know that I have to add you know like maybe an extra 30 minutes to my journey because the traffic is going to be slower and mm. during the winter I suppose we're really spoiled here that we generally don't have issues with traffic you know yeah. maybe someone moving the cows or something but not cars you know blocking up the roads especially <laughs> those roads are very narrow and twisty and people who are not used to that in the rental cars they're terrible they, they're it's, terrible it's really hard it's hard to drive i think i i suppose a few years ago i when i first sort of started living here again as an adult and working mm. in the area I, I would have been like oh my god the summer traffic it's so bad i can't deal with it but i think maybe i've just started to mellow because i'm mm. getting older or something <laughs> but i have a little bit more understanding now i suppose some of my friends have come over from other countries mm -hmm. and particularly from america we were driving on the other side of the road as yeah, well that, that's, and that's, <laughs> you ride because it's not, not only the road is very narrow and bendy and twisty and all things and the sheep on it and all yeah. that but you're still driving on the on the other side of the road on the it's other like, side oh, <laughs> i met i met a woman from texas probably about two years ago now she was driving a rental car <laughs> uh, around the ring of Kerry, and she, she'd been told it was a day trip but uh -huh. she was used to the roads in Texas, which are like six lane highways. <laughs> and, and like one lane is like three of our roads here. So yeah, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have a road that, that wide, like one she lane in Texas. She was terrified. She was absolutely terrified. And I met her in Caradaniel, like walking my dog. So it was evening mm. time. And, and she was beside herself, just like distraught because she was like, oh, how bad are the roads from here on? And am I going to make it back to Limerick? in time to get a hotel and I was like it's it's like seven o'clock here and you're in Cara Daniel and and for me it's like a three-hour drive to Limerick mm -hmm. and and you're really not driving uh, like I could drive <laughs> on these roads so I like I genuinely felt really really bad for her because mm -hmm. I was like oh you shouldn't have been told to try and do it in a day you know you're yeah. whizzing past things and from Limerick uh, yeah in and, a day and for me I feel That's like crazy. you're you're missing out on so much yeah because you don't have chance to just stop and enjoy it so I'd always say like take take longer it's better but you know and this is something that is that is kind of repeated theme that people are saying oh tourists coming in and they do like okay one day this boom and then then the next day ring of carry boom and then like come on you don't you just don't see anything you know you don't you miss all the special things you know like like the sitting on the lake in the rain like figuring yeah. your kids figuring out what a hermit crab is for the first time yeah. like all of those sort of special it's experiences a week, right? it's a oh, week oh yeah at minimum you've got to let it soak in you know that yeah. ireland isn't a place that you can just see in one day and head mm -hmm. off and and get the feeling of it you know it's yeah. it is yeah. a place where you have to sort of change your clock a little bit yeah just so just like we're saying oh any fine day give us a call and we'll try yeah. and take you yeah. out you know we're, <laughs> we're working a little bit of a different schedule so i yeah. think it you need to take more time to properly appreciate that and, yeah, and get the proper feeling for the place absolutely so listen eddie so we have an upcoming an event called ivora learning landscapes we do and and that event was obviously i was i was invited thank you very much i was invited last You're very year welcome. uh to that event which uh as a result was uh, quite a few episodes of the podcast and so that event is uh running uh, every october yeah uh, is it which would is it second edition is the third edition which is i think this year is the fourth, fourth. edition fourth edition so i missed i think two. we wow. started in 2016 yes yeah, sorry tommy like i'd have invited you if i knew you but i just <laughs> i mean i only yeah. met you last year like <laughs> i know i know <laughs> <laughs> we um, we started it in myself and lucy or, or sort of co-coordinators or partners in crime is maybe a better description yeah. um we started in 2016 in October 2016 and have run it every year since. So 2019 will be the fourth edition of Evera wow. Learning Landscapes. Yeah. So tell so tell us what 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 is it and and what to expect. What to, what is it? So it's it's a weekend event. Uh, it runs from Friday evening through to Monday, mm -hmm. and it really centers around, I suppose, outdoor education, place-based learning, nature connection. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're kind of all the the keywords that I keep using in the advertising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what I mostly get from people that attend really is that it's just it's just a really nice way to meet like-minded people and sort of mm -hmm. have a really great weekend out 
out in the landscape yeah. and learning new things and meeting new people and you know discussing topics that you care about and yeah yeah just generally having a good time how, how would you describe it is it conference is it symposium is it's it... it's very hard to to yeah. put it into a little box i sometimes i say learning landscapes festival but then i feel like we need more balloons or something exactly and because and sometimes like... i say conference and then i think oh it needs to be a little bit more highbrow and a bit more serious if it's going to be a conference but yeah, like two I've... days ago we were working on the on the on the promo video, and and for for people who are listening to that, go to Tommy Seldor's YouTube channel right now. And if that video is not there while you're listening to that, subscribe. It will be there shortly, but probably it will be already there. So anyway, we were shooting that video, and as I'm working on it, I was thinking like it's something missing kind of like how to describe is it yeah conference is it like you say festival is it it's it's a it tough symposium? one like, yeah so the because there's so many things <laughs> it's like you have a tracks like well they're not really tracks but kind of like a tracks that goes in parallel so that's like a conference right because, yeah because yeah so you you have like three or four workshops happening all at the same time and you just that's frustrating one that's frustrating that's always frustrating me on the them. conferences like i want to be on you, this you get and come this. back next year and, <laughs> and you can pick a different one you know there's there's nothing to stop you're coming back yeah, again yeah, yeah. <laughs> no that's not, look I, i'm just i'm just i'm just joking it's it's you know you have so many time so much time and so much attempt so many attend attendees and, and and people who are giving those workshops so it's it's uh the only way to do it yeah we did, we've had a lot of discussion around that actually in in sort of the the organizing and the management side of it and that is feedback that's come up several times about oh i really wanted to go to all of these things but you know mm -hmm. they're all happening at the same time but really working within the constraints of a weekend mm -hmm. we're yeah. so limited by how many and then i feel if we shorten the workshops you're you're almost taking away from the experience that you could have with that facilitator you know like mm -hmm. like two hours isn't really a long time to be mm -hmm. working on a topic and so mm -hmm. to get it a depends proper on the facilitators but you have a best facilitators <laughs> yeah. ever so it's not like but people the... want to spend more time with them well, than yeah, two it's hours not, it's, so. <laughs> it's not boring so 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 people who are listening to that and they used to the corporate meetings where the hour is like absolutely Absolutely. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not oh, like that. No, no. This, like these that. are these are limited to two hours because, it, I mean, some some of our facilitators could literally lead you on a week's excursion mm -hmm. and you just laugh and cry and laugh the whole time. You know, you'd, you'd really be engaged. And all of the workshops really are hands on. Most of them are outdoors. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a case of sort of like you're saying about a conference. It's not really a sit back and listen and maybe ask a question yeah. at the end. They're no all really interactive. <laughs> oh, no, no. Very, very, very limited PowerPoints. And yeah, really interactive. Mm. And how what was the idea? How, how did you come up with the idea to do this? The idea. So we borrowed the idea, actually. So the, the idea of a learning landscape symposium um, started in the Burn Bio. So with Burn Bio Trust. Um, their, what is it? What is it? their learning landscape symposium has been running, I couldn't even guess how long, I'd say nearly 10 years. It's a pretty wow. well established event. Mm -hmm. They hold it in March every year. And mm -hmm. if anyone uh, is interested in this kind of event and can't make it to Eva yeah. Learning Landscapes, absolutely go to the one in the Burren. Mm -hmm. um, myself and Lucy... I think it was probably the year before we started Evra Learning Landscapes that we both traveled up. I think I'd got back from, I was traveling in Australia and I'd moved home and she'd open see Synergy and I was volunteering with her and she's like, oh, I've heard it this weekend. Let's let's go and see what it's about. And I think there'll be a lot of interesting stuff for us because mm -hmm. we were both interested in the outdoor education and all that kind of stuff. So we headed up to Kinvara and just had like, we're just blown away. Like we just had the most amazing weekend, hmm. met just the most wonderful people and like just were buzzing, like absolutely buzzing when we came home, just going like, that was fantastic. That was so, so amazing. Like such an interesting way to learn and upskill to have this sort of conference where or symposium where people are sharing their ideas and, and you're getting to experience different topics and different workshops within the space of the weekend you know it was mm -hmm. it was really fantastic but also sort of networking and and making that connection and and starting to feel like like i think outdoor education has come a long way since since i first started experiencing it particularly in the way that we deliver it here in waterville and so at the time you sort of felt like you were one of a few crazy people that were telling everyone to get outdoors and learn so to have a whole symposium a whole weekend ded dedicated to that kind of educational style was fantastic you know it was really mm. amazing for us to experience and I think that really inspired us then and, and then when it came around to the next year we were kind of going 
you know what, we, we should try and do something similar down in Ivara because, ah. you know, we, we've got a lot of outdoor educators here. We've got an amazing landscape. We're trying to get people to go out and learn in the outdoors rather than, you know, do it the traditional way, sit inside mm-hmm. with a PowerPoint and a book. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, in 2016, we sat down one day and just said, OK, this is it. We're, we're going to do it. Wow. <laughs> going to put it together. Yeah. It must have been success since it's like a fourth edition. Yeah, it's been it's been successful so far. It is I suppose it's it's run mostly on a volunteer basis as a mm-hmm. not for profit sort of event that we do. Mm-hmm. Um so there is kind of a time commitment and you know what we get a lot of help from a lot of people. Like we have volunteers every year that help us with advertising and all of the workshop facilitators you know offer their time for the promotions and stuff completely free so Mm -hmm. it really is sort of a collaborative event which myself and lucy just coordinate really Mm -hmm. but um yeah it's it's been successful it's it's you know i think that this this kind of ensures that the people involved are really want to do it rather than kind of want it but then they're doing that for money so and that i think that ultimately that raises the quality of the event because people are really want to do it and and they're putting their heart and soul we've been really really lucky with having we've had so many amazing facilitators come forward and offer you know Mm -hmm. like last year i think three or four of the workshops i i hadn't them planned but so many Mm -hmm. people sort of stepped forward and said oh i had a really good idea or i'd really like to try and do this and Mm -hmm. yeah it's been there's been a really good response from people in in that way and that they they want to be a part of it you know they want to contribute so hopefully that continues and everyone Um, enjoys it this year again yeah i have no doubt i have no doubt um what do you mean by outdoor education like what is the 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 you know meaning of that maybe in separation from ivory learning landscape just 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 for a second is it because this is term like come across in in different places as well as outdoor education is it to do to educate about nature and connection with nature or is the idea is more broad and say like well if you need to learn your you know uh your equations or your economy or whatever else go outdoor because your 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 brain works better like is, is that so i i think there is there's probably an element of both of those but definitely the the second one you described outdoor education if you're going to sort of define it, I think really would be to take education outdoors Mm. because people do, they relax, they feel happier, they feel more engaged, they they feel more with themselves when they're outside. Mm. Um, And so that can increase their ability to learn different things from everything from language to maths to biology, you know, all of the subjects. Um, We're really lucky that we have uh, Anders Szpanski, who works in the University of Linköping, please forgive my pronunciations, um, in Sweden. And he is a professor of outdoor education. And he's worked Mm. with us over the last few years of learning landscapes. And and that's certainly how he's described it to me in in that you you use your whole body to learn. And so if you're sitting in a chair Mm. and reading a book, you're, you're not really engaging every part of yourself that could be participating in the learning whereas yes. when you take that outside and you're having action and you're creating muscle memory and you know you're you're engaging with your whole body with all of your senses because you have to be not just aware of what you're learning but aware of your surroundings and the people around you and what's going on in yes. nature and that it, it brings the learning home to you a little bit stronger than it does when it's by rote <laughs> I, 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 I read about this as well that even go for a walk you know like like and there's a more and more um, kind of coaches in the corporate world even saying like well it's not good you you sitting at your desk all the time just get out just just go walk you know stop thinking about it go b-. and I read somewhere there is a whole kind of hormonal response in your body where it's what your brain produces, all the chemicals that your brain produces and, you know, your your body starts moving and you, your breathing changes and your heart rate changes and all that. And all that has a impact how the brain works and it aids the education. So the outdoor education, in short, is much broader. It's just education in general, which... Is better. It's quicker. Yeah. You can I think. I think everything is pretty much better if you can get outdoors. Really. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. it's, Tom, it's called Tommy's Outdoors for a reason, <laughs> right? It's, it's a little better. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I read a book recently called Blue Mind, and it was mm-hmm. talking about the whole science behind how getting out in nature, specifically around bodies of water, really improves like your oh. your mental health, your your um, 
just your 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 well being in general, really. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of science, like neuroscience, backing yes. that up. You know that that getting outside, taking a walk, taking a break from being inside under artificial lights. You know, feeling the wind, feeling the oh, rain, like the, it, the artificial <laughs> lights. It makes you feel better all round, better. Yes, and and there also you know your circ- circadian rhythm is kind of completely screwed up uh, because of the lights, and you 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 kind of shining this blue light way too long into your eyes and then yeah. you're not sleeping and then you get sleep deprived and then everything goes downhill from that and you end up on the pills just to go by. That's wrong. <laughs> just go go outside, people. I, I did read an article recently and I can't remember um, where it was, but there there was somewhere where there was a movement within the, the medical profession to prescribe like going yes. outdoors yes. as a, as a treatment for people who are struggling with social anxiety yes. or nervousness or or a lot of different sort of more emotional mental conditions um and i definitely feel it myself i mean i know when i haven't been outdoors for a while uh, you know i think yeah, i, I suppose it. i i grew up on a farm so i'm used to being like mm. very connected to like you said the the run of the day you know like uh-huh. certain things happen in the morning and then your day flows through and you have to you know put the chickens to bed in the evening and you've got a, a pretty pretty well tied into the natural environment yes. sort of lifestyle so i know for a while when i lived in a city i, f- mm-hmm. I felt like an alien in a strange world you know <laughs> i was like but what do people do here and what do you do in the evenings and oh you're just gonna sit and watch tv oh god okay you know it's it was really it was unusual you know it was mm-hmm. a really different lifestyle for me to get used to and, and for a while I, I fell into the pattern and i was like oh no it's fine i can do this i think i'm okay and and then um, when I moved again and ended up back in a, in a rural setting and, and mm-hmm. doing more farm work and sort of uh, more activity based work like I was used to, I was like, oh, yeah. I feel so much better, you yes. know, just just more myself, more relaxed, happier. And yeah, I, I just I probably said it on this podcast, uh, you know, we, we I have all, all over 50 episodes. I probably said it already 50 times. <laughs> But I'm going to say one more time. I'm glad that I'm bringing out the usual stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to say one more time. I Until I, because I, obviously I was born in the city, born and raised, city boy, work in the city, finish university in the city, all city, city, tarmac, concrete, traffic jams, all that. And when I moved in here 12 years ago and I start kind of being embedded like in the natural environment, you know, go fishing, go here and like climb the mountain or, or walk up the mountain. And I'm going back to the city, whether I'm traveling back back to, uh, to visit my parents or even I'm going to Dublin. I start seeing how damaging that environment is for people. It's like you straight away see many people who are you can see that something is wrong with them. You don't know what, but it's like it's like man, you, this is this is bad. Like this, shit, this the yeah. whole environment is bad. This is like, just... I find it. I find it pretty stressful. Actually, I think I have I have a lot of friends that live in Dublin and. Um, and they're always kind of laughing about me being, you know, the culture and what have you. But um, <laughs> I do, I find it pretty stressful to to go into the city because mm-hmm. it's I, it's almost like a sensory ov- overload yeah. from being in a place where we're so close to nature and so connected to it on a daily basis. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like literally across the road from Sea Synergy, mm-hmm. there's the sea. <laughs> it's, like, yes. it's like you're pretty much on the beach all day, like you're outdoors, you're, you're doing activity all the time. And then... Mm. When you go into a city and it's even trying to get to sleep in a hotel and there's street lights outside so it's not yes. dark and there's always traffic no matter exactly. what time it's of the day dark. it is it's I, always I, traffic it's not dark and, at night how does that yeah. work how are you supposed to sleep it's not dark one of my uh, when i was in university one of my friends came over and she'd grown up in a city in north england mm-hmm. um and she stayed with us for about a week down in in my parents place in caradaniel yeah and she was saying when she, the first couple of nights she was there, I was like, oh, are you okay? You know, and she's like, I'm not sleeping really well. And I was like, oh, why, why, what's wrong with you? You know, mm-hmm. it's, I was like, you've got the best room in the house. You're the guest, you know, how can you not be sleeping well? <laughs> and she said, oh, it's, it's too dark. What? It's too dark to oh. sleep. And I, I was kind of looking at her like just completely nonplussed. Like, Girl, yeah. you, there you have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I was like catching flies. My mouth dropped open. Just like, what What do you mean it's too dark? And she's like, I've never seen it get dark before like this. And I was like, what? <laughs> like every night? Like, uh, what have you been doing this whole time? But she lived in a housing estate with a streetlight right outside her bedroom window. Oh, so God. she always had that sort of yellow orange glow in the background. And she was not used to it being dark. So oh. for her, 
prefer to actually stand outside in Cardaniel where you're actually in the middle of like the Kerry Dark Sky Reserve and you know you can see the Milky Way just like spread out across the sky above you she was absolutely mind boggled she's like I've never seen that many stars I've they never seen there. it so dark yeah they're always there <laughs> but it, and we were in our early 20s you know she'd gone yeah. 20 years without yeah. seeing that just because of the environment that yes. she grew up in so yes. yeah I, I do oh. often think like with people in cities I, I don't know there's <laughs> there I wouldn't want to do it for a long time for sure you see but you don't know about it I just I'm just I'm just thinking about myself you don't you don't really know about it you know I was I was lucky enough that my parents had like a summer house so I usually was spending like a you know two months in the summer kind of in the in the rural setting um, but a lot of people just they don't know and even if they go on a holiday somewhere they they still book in in the hotel and do, do the same thing that they the do same, at home it's, it's yeah. exactly it's the same yeah. thing so I, I think i think that's really part of what i enjoy so much about working with c synergy and the way that we operate and that we sort of we take people out on these adventures and they're they're all like perfectly safe you know there's mm -hmm. they're really well thought out they're really well planned we know what the weather's going to do you know we know what's going to happen and and we really look after people well but for a lot of people we're actually really at the edge of their comfort zone because they haven't had any experience to compare that spider? to exactly you know <laughs> So it's it's pretty amazing that you get to be the person that takes them out and, and gets them to, you know, hold a shore crab for the first time or uh -huh. realize that an, an enemy is an animal or, yeah. you know, touch seaweed or, you know, it's really simple things. You're going to be this things. rugged, tough guy, like, <laughs> look, seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we ever get that going home about it, but <laughs> <laughs> there'd be like, I, I've had some people come and they, they've just said like, this has been the most amazing part of our trip because, you know, there, no way would we have gone and done this without coming on, on, yeah. a, a, on an activity with you. You yeah. know, they wouldn't think to go, even though they're sitting on the beach, they wouldn't think to go and look in the rock pools and try and figure out what the animals are or try and learn a little bit about yeah. them. And, and we try and make it accessible for people so they get the opportunity to do those things and learn things about the animals that... You, you've got to be interested in science to have sat and read the book or read the paper that taught you that thing. But exactly. now we can make it accessible knowledge and, and get people engaged in what's going exactly. on in the environment around them. And All you city dwellers, see yeah. synergy. Water, water. <laughs> Come and join us on the beach. <laughs> exactly. Okay, let's let's go back to Ivor Learning Landscape. So so the idea was was kind of you you borrow the idea. You looked at it and said, yeah. oh, it's a, it's a great thing. And then we have all, all the facilitators. And... Um, so what people can accept, expect uh, for, because I would, are the tickets still available or are the, you sold out? Yep, the tickets are still available. Um, if they're not sold out, we'll have them for sale right up until probably one or two days before the event, depending on how much admin I want to do on the last day before the event. <laughs> um, so they're on Eventbrite, so you can just check out, if you search Eva Learning Landscapes on Eventbrite, it mm -hmm. will hopefully come up if I've mm -hmm. set up the page right. Mm -hmm. Um the weekend runs, so the opening night, we like to have kind of like a registration where people get to come and mill around and meet each other and figure out what's happening over the weekend and which workshops they want to go to and okay. where they can get so, a nice dinner and so all that like, kind of like stuff. So like informal kind of... Really informal, yeah. yeah okay. Super informal on the Friday. And we, we do have talks happening on the Friday evening as well. And they'll start mm -hmm. about 6.30. We have two keynote speakers. So we mm -hmm. have Stephen Pickering and mm -hmm. Anita McKeown. Mm -hmm. And then after them, we'll have a short break and then we'll have a panel discussion. Right. Um, the panel discussion is made up of, I think it's four uh, researchers that are working on projects that are based in the Ivora Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got a, quite a, a good mix of people. Mm -hmm. um, some are working on environmental projects like a sea trout project. Um, someone else is working on um the impact of biodiversity on visitor experience or oh. i could be totally paraphrasing here so forgive me if i'm getting it wrong um we have another uh researcher who's working on more of like a, a social social uh <laughs> I can't say the word, sorry, socioeconomic study. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking more at coastal communities and intergenerational um, oh. uh, sustainability. Uh, so oh, a really good mix of people. And I think we have someone also confirmed from the Kerry Life Project. Mm -hmm. So that would have been focusing on sort of uh, farmland management, water quality and mm -hmm. the pearl mussel. Um, so that is hopefully going to be a really interesting discussion around what, this kind of research can give to an area you know right. like like there's a lot of projects going on not everybody knows that they're happening and how does that information yes. get out there but also 
what's the point of it? You know, like what's the benefit of that information for the community here? So is it research for research sake or are we contributing to something greater, mm -hmm. you know? And, and mm -hmm. as a community in Ivara, how can we start to understand these projects better and then maybe make them work for us a little bit more? Well, and that's, in, that's important because, uh, you know, I, I think that especially in, the, in like this day and age, I feel like a science is a little bit in crisis for various reasons. I don't, I don't want to get into that because that's probably we could sit here and talk put another two <laughs> We'd hours. We'd be like, how long have you got? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but I think it's 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 what what you 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 hit the nail on the head. Like get people to kind of understand and get involved. It's like ah, so that's what you're doing. So this is kind of yeah. connected with that rather than uh, you know I I I. I had that experience talking with various people where for, for them, the scientists are these people who are, you know, have a uh, 100,000 worth of gear strapped into the helicopter and they're doing something. And what do they know? They get, get they got all these things wrong, like get out of it. And then, you know, when there is any recommendation, scientific recommendations, there is natural resistance. Like what, what, what do they know about what we're doing? And on the flip side, quite often those people are actually know better and know more and have this information because they live and breathe, you know, for a number of it that these scientists don't have because they can't. And this is very important to kind of do this. Yeah, and, and I think we do see a lot of projects now where you're seeing that connection starting to be made. So mm. the, there'll be several work packages and, and one of them generally is focused on sort of the, the community and the society around the issue and sort of looking yeah. at it more from a holistic point of view rather than saying, okay, we have this little thing happening in this little mm -hmm. box over here and we're just going to look at that. Yeah. They're looking at it more in, in real world terms and sort mm -hmm. of looking at it in, in, okay, well, it's not happening in a vacuum. It's happening within this community and within this society. So yes. how can we start to, you know, look at the problem, but then also look at other things that might be more of the problem rather than the thing that we think is the problem yeah so, so rather than oh, you know that's making fantastic. these scientific assumptions we're we're actually looking at the community and seeing okay what what knowledge is here you know what understanding is here already and and mm -hmm. how is that impacting the thing that we want to research and and can we make that a positive impact you know and, and how can we start to work together in those terms and you know this is so just this is such a common thing and i i recently made a con connection even uh, believe it or not, to computer software, but it's the same mechanism that quite often people who who don't know the the you know the ground truth, the reality of the situation, are making decisions, right? So there are people sitting up in Dublin and in London making decisions about people who are living with you know a problem or an issue or something and they completely don't understand like you said the community the the, the you know the mechanics the the all the relations right and the same stuff happened in the software where you know like there is a decision is being made in the meeting room completely not taking into account actual users who are using software and doing something and you know and then i i think there was the that they ended up with a hippo, which is decision made by highest paid person in the room. So, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so yeah. that's so that's great. That, because that sounds really true, actually. And I like that one, hippo, yeah. highest paid person in the room. Um, I, I think. I, I suppose I, I, I work as a research assistant on a project that uh, the principal investigator is Dr. Anita McKeown, who's speaking on the Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, and that project is focused around the sustainable development goals and how we can engage communities and youths in the, the sort of targets of the sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. but in like uh, using STEAM education and place-based initiatives. Wow. Um, and a lot of what we talked about when we started that project, a lot of discussions were around like the, the kind of siloed thinking that we have in certain areas mm -hmm. and how can we start to break down those? You know, there, there's a big move within science definitely towards sort of a more interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach. So you have yeah. people from a lot of different backgrounds mm -hmm. of expertise working on the same project. So mm -hmm. those perspectives that can all come together and, and make a bigger picture than what one of them would have. Yeah. 
Yeah, and this is exactly like like yourself. You're a scientist, but you're living actually here, so you're kind of like a both worlds. You, 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 yeah, you could, you could, yeah. I think and, I think it's special for me because I do feel like I sort of stand oh, well, across. Well, I'm trying that to say we need more bit. people like you, Ellie. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> There's a few people that could do it less than me. That's for sure. <laughs> but um, there is, and I think I I'm lucky that I had the opportunity to get this job and to work in this area and to be able to to go from working on uh, from a science perspective perspective to working more on communications and community engagement mm-hmm. um and i think that's something that i've always found really interesting is oh it's great that we know this stuff but how mm-hmm. do we make it relevant like how do we yeah. how do we get people to be interested in it and yes. i think for me when i was growing up i was always kind of the slightly weird kid that was into science and biology <laughs> and nature and and it was a li- always felt a little bit different that way mm-hmm. But for me, I was always just drawn to the wonder of it, you know, like yes. how amazing is it that a spider makes a web and, mm-hmm. you know, how how fascinating is it how a tree transports water and, you know, there's just amazing things that are happening around us every day that we never, mm-hmm. we never even noticed, you know, we very yeah. rarely stop to look at them. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I think a large part of wanting to work in this area is trying to get people to see that in the same with the same fascination that I have yeah. you know to sort of share a little bit of that that passion and get people to sort of look at it and go oh wow rather than go oh why is she looking at that spider <laughs> like what she, why should we call her away what's she doing over <laughs> there that spider. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is I suppose this is what people can expect on either a learning landscapes just to get this exact connection and get fascinated by things and, and learn about various, various aspects of it absolutely so so what else what can you give us example of a couple of the workshops and 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 you know panels i suppose that... definitely definitely so we we talked a little bit about the panels on friday night so mm-hmm. i'll i'll go on and i'll talk a little bit about some of the workshops that we'll have um so we have on saturday there's two different workshop blocks so there'll be mm-hmm. 10 till 2 and 2 till 4 and in the 10 till 2 slot i think we have maybe five running and mm-hmm. then in the two to four, there's four. So you have to make some difficult choices mm-hmm. about which ones you're going to attend. Well, um, that goes with the territory, I suppose. <laughs> <yeah>. you know. <laughs> Sorry, we haven't changed that aspect of it yet. Um, but some, some of the the workshops that we have that some people will be familiar with is like seaweed foraging with John mm-hmm. Fitzgerald and Carrie That's Ann. the one I missed last year and that's, I'm definitely not going to miss this, this it's, year. Oh yeah, it, it's not to be missed but yeah. I've had to put four other workshops on at the same he, time so I'm sorry, some of good, you will be missing it. Eating, he got people eating a, a jellyfish. He so. made me eat the jellyfish, he made, Tommy. I, he made me eat it. Well, I would love to eat the jellyfish. <laughs> I was I was actually, when I heard about it, I knew that I, I screwed up not by not going to oh, that. I would and, love to so last that year. one is for me that's that's for sure like hey john give me a jellyfish where's that hey, jellyfish? <laughs> last year the tides weren't wonderful so that was one of our fringe events so that, right. that actually happened before the other yeah. workshops um but yeah he he just whipped that jellyfish right off the sand and washed it in a rock pool and sliced it up and was like here eat this and uh, i'm here I'm, yeah. I'm there for a jellyfish <laughs> and it's like that's 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 one for it me. was one of the the most memorable parts of the workshop for I sure know, i know <laughs> i still remember <laughs> that even though I, I haven't attended that so i was like yes this year <laughs> there are many school kids around kerry that i've told my i ate a jellyfish story <laughs> to as well so you're not the only one that remembers that workshop for that reason uh. <laughs> uh, so some of the other ones that we have on um, we have Niall Hogan who does wild plant, plant medicine mm-hmm. um, that's a really really lovely workshop if you've got any interest in sort of like what everyone else calls weeds I suppose mm-hmm. um, you do a really great walk around his garden and he talks about the medicinal properties of certain plants and mm-hmm. a little bit about how you might prepare them or how they might have been used to treat different ailments so yes. super super interesting lots of information definitely bring like a notebook and pen to that one because you'll mm-hmm. kick yourself if you didn't because mm-hmm. you won't remember it all from listening to him you'll want to write it down and go back over it again um we also have kira nugent who's talking about native woodland development oh that's one i i i was on that on i was on his panel last year and i then subsequently have him on the podcast i don't remember off the top of my head which number of the podcast it, it was it was the last podcast last year so not the greatest time because people were all busy with Christmas and so on. So I kind of like run another social media cycle after. But it was it was memorable because I was I want to talk about obviously native woodlands and planting and you know deer in the woodlands and so on. 
And he went on and he gave the whole history oh, of yeah. forestry in, in Ireland and how it started. And he, he, he actually, he started in the Ice Age. That's amazing. And, how it, and I was sitting there as like, wow. So we covered in, the, in, this, in this podcast. So if you're, if you, if you're listening to this and would like to listen, this, his name is Kieran Nunjan. And um, he, in that podcast, you have everything from Ice Age to history of the forestry to, to political history of Ireland and how that shaped forestry down to forest machinery and how, <laughs> how they work and how they build so they not sink into the ground. It's like, it was awesome. He's, he's like an encyclopedia, actually. Yes. Yeah, I felt like that. And, and the workshop, I was like, oh, my God, where did we find this guy? He's amazing. Like... Uh, and to be honest, I'm trying to remember now how I first got in touch with him and I, I don't, but mm. I'm so glad that we had him there because I think that re- that workshop really was a highlight that, for a lot was, of people last year. It was funny year. because I actually met him earlier. I met him I, and believe it or not, I met him at the shooting range. He was zeroing wow. his gun and I was target practicing and we were just talking about targets and magazines and all that. And it was like, all right. And we, you know, never, never had a second thought about it. And then last year on the, on the, on the, on the panel, we kind of were sitting on the, before the, the, the presentation or before that workshop started, we were kind of sitting on the, and we were like looking at each other. Don't I know you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this, you know, like you, you're not, not looking, but you're looking and it was like, have I met you at the shooting range? And he goes, yes! Says, oh, this is... <laughs> so it's not like a, some sort of a weird... <laughs> so definitely that's Brilliant. that's that's recommended. That's a that, great That's session. happened a few times for people, actually. They, they've, they've all come down to Everall Learning Landscapes and sort of mm-hmm. sat across the room going, I'm sure they look familiar. Where did I meet them before? And then, <laughs> then realize they'd had some connection somewhere yes. previously. Yeah. yeah, Really good stories out of it. Um... <laughs> So uh, some of the other workshops, um, I'm trying to remember them off mm-hmm. the top of my head now. We have uh, Sean O'Leary, who's mm-hmm. our local Shanaki. So he's doing mm-hmm. a workshop on storytelling in nature. Mm-hmm. Um I really love Sean just because his energy is so good. You know, you, you he's a character. Of, his oh, character is like, he's like, he's one of those people you always want to invite to the party just because you know yes, that just him being ex- there, exactly. it'll, it'll end up being one of those hilarious nights yes. where something happens, you know? Um, yeah. So his workshops are a little bit like that. You feel mm-hmm. like you've kind of gone to someone's party, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's really good fun. Uh, he's got a really nice sort of genuine way of, mm-hmm. of drawing people out. And even though like storytelling maybe isn't something that people mm-hmm. jump on and go, oh yeah I'm a really good storyteller or oh, I'd like to do storytelling mm-hmm. um, if you go to his workshop you'll suddenly just be like well I can use this storytelling skill in so many different ways you mm-hmm. know and, and it's something that like I've done myself and then found myself on the beach talking to kids suddenly being Sean O'Leary and mm-hmm. gesticulating wildly just like he does when he tells his yeah. stories and stuff yeah. and yeah, yeah yeah really 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 fun it's, workshop and, and it's and it's like you said it's a great skill and and again for for people who are perhaps you know in a corporate setting or anything like that, it's great skill to have on Absolutely. the on the presentation on the, when, or when you have to convince your boss that that project is a good project and you need funding or what it's it's exact and even in the marketing as well everything revolves around stories it's everywhere we're we're sort of we're, we're animals of stories yes. really. you know like human beings are stories so exactly i think it is like you said it's it's one of those skills that could be transferable across so uh, many different across, areas yes because that's what what helps keep attention if if you're talking to somebody and you're not telling a story in a way, you're gonna lose them. You're not gonna. you their attention is gone. But you kind of wrapping that as a story, and story has those elements and all that. And then it's like, yeah, why did it went so well? Well, because Absolutely. you. So another one. That's another, another one. Another one. Yeah, definitely another one to go. They're all really good. Like, but you're gonna have a difficulty picking yeah, the one that you want to go to. By the time we're done this podcast, <laughs> people will will look when up I the agenda. It's like. Hey, <laughs> um, so another one that we have is um, we're doing an art one so a local artist down a winder is going to be doing landscape art mm-hmm. um, so that's going to be a painting I think she works with mostly mm-hmm. and just tons of fun again and, and sort of tapping into that creativity that sometimes people I suppose as adults you know you stop Mm-hmm. You stop coloring in the books in the evening yeah. or, you know, finger painting yeah. or, you know, making the potato stamps and stuff like that. <laughs> so I, I find that a lot of people that went to her workshop the last time, I don't think we had her last year. I think it was the year before. 
um we just had such lovely uh reviews from it that people were just like oh i can't believe i i don't sit and paint or you know i i look mm-hmm. at the place differently because of how she described it to try and paint it and things yeah. so yeah really really special sort of facilitator able to bring stuff out in people that they they don't think is sitting there so wow. yeah wow. really nice um another one that we have is we have um an eco cleaning workshop so you're going to learn how to make your own cleaning products with eco-friendly uh oh. ingredients oh. um so that's awesome i'm trying to remember it's actually my friend sarah albrecht and rebecca murphy mm-hmm. who will be facilitating the workshop because the woman who runs the company that does it is actually away that week so she's trained them up mm-hmm. and she's gonna uh-huh. give them all the materials and the instructions and you're gonna get a chance to make them so um i did a workshop with her a couple of weeks ago actually it was mm-hmm. really great so i i got washing up liquid uh laundry liquid mm-hmm. hand soap so just really simple recipes and it made it seem so cheap to make your own from home i was sort of thinking god i'm so lazy going to the shop and buying these and mm-hmm. and not making the effort yeah. um so i think that'll be really good fun and, and I you think, don't have these all these chemicals into and you them. don't have all the chemicals yeah exactly mm-hmm. it's per- perfectly safe um and that's going to be a really good one for kids as well so mm-hmm. if you're coming as a family bring mm-hmm. the kids along and sean's as well actually that's open mm-hmm. for families so right. if you're bringing kids of any age they can join in on those too and i think the 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 cleaning products are going to be a lot of fun because they, they just yeah. love that sort of like science of putting everything together um, and the storytelling one as well. Wow. Um, we do have a few... Uh, are we already some, on Sunday? Or is it still oh, Saturday? I've gone. I've skipped all over the place. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> oh, no, we're still on Saturday. We're, oh, we're still, still on Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. And it's I'm only trying to Saturday. remember when everything's happening. I'm and going, it's only Saturday. <laughs> this is all on Saturday. Um, so Stephen Pickering, our keynote speaker, who mm-hmm. uh, works a lot with education, outdoor education, um, he's going to do the, the talk on the Friday night, but he's also doing a workshop on the Saturday. Uh-huh. Um, so if you're interested in sort of more the the professional side of education, outdoor education, how to engage people in using the outdoors as a learning tool, things like that, definitely the workshop to go to. Wow. So yeah, I mean, last year we had some um, teacher training students who came down um, and the, those were the kind of workshops that they they really got the most benefit mm-hmm. from. So yeah, if that's that's the area you're interested in, he's the guy to go and see. Uh, we also have Anders and Bola Shespanski who will be doing an early years teaching one. So mm-hmm. Anders and Bola are on in Saturday morning and then Stephen Pickering is happening Saturday afternoon. So you can make it to both if you're coming oh. more for sort of the, the professional development side of it mm-hmm. rather than the, the nature connection side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, both super interesting and and both definitely uh if you're interested in like i said the more the more serious side of the outdoor education and the science behind it and how to get people engaged and how to how to bring people outside and and teach them subjects Mm -hmm. those are the two guys that you want to (laughs) be hugging up with and meeting um so i think that's it for the workshops oh no i forgot one really amazing workshop so we're having a drum making workshop oh this is the one i don't actually want to tell too many people about it because i want there to be space for me to go to this one um so it's my friend you mean? You're, a, you're an Bounce. organizer you always oh, yeah. space for you. <laughs> if there's not enough material i won't get to go um <laughs> elaine bounce is making drums so she makes them out of recycled materials hmm. um i'm not a musical person so i find a kind of magic about people that are able to do musical things right. anyway so i think that's why people I'm, who can play, I'm super fascinated people who can play and actually it kind of comes together as a music that's like <gasps> uh, yeah <laughs> How did you do that? exactly yeah and she's she's I, making I these know. drums I'm, from I'm like scratch that. <laughs> so she she gets um like pipe so like industrial pipe mm-hmm. um recycled sails so old sails from sailboats mm-hmm. and she's using um fishing net that she's actually like unpicked the knots and turned it back into string Wow! and she puts those all together i think it's um i think it's more of like a native american style mm-hmm. drum making mm-hmm. i could be getting that totally wrong um but yeah you make a drum mm. you, you make a drum in and the then workshop. you kind of can and then you play can play it. it and then on the saturday night um mel and elaine run what's called fin of drum and that is a huge communal drum so it's like oh. the size of the room we're sitting in right. and everyone gets around it and plays it all together wow and it's insane and amazing wow. yeah so, so and you'll one. be able to bring your own drum then if you've done the workshop too so huh. yeah huh. so that'll be a pretty pretty special workshop too wow. i think um, so then Saturday evening then is all about sort of chilling out and enjoying yourself. Mm-hmm. We we have a communal feast. So um, 
we just bring a giant pot of stew normally <laughs> and everyone just takes what they want and you know sits and enjoys it has a bit of a chat I then remember we have the- <laughs> that one too as well that's i mean that's, lovely. it's yeah this is like a perfect kind of uh conclusion to, or, or or maybe not conclusion but kind of summary after the day you go in and you like you've been outdoors so you're kind of hungry and it was like wow you, you get yeah. the setting and you get to talk to people and everybody is there and it's like it's awesome yeah it's that, that kind of feeling you know when you're at a party and you don't want to go home yes. i think you get to the end of the workshop yes. and you're like oh no is that it and then you're like no it's not there's yeah. something happening this evening too <laughs> and yeah and then you get to meet everyone again and join in and mm-hmm. and again it's another chance to network with everyone so there that's kind of the opportunity aside from the friday night when you've all sort of mingled for the first time mm-hmm. on the saturday night then it gives people that chance for you know just casual friendships and and yeah. getting to know people better and and sort of linking up with people that you think you might want to collaborate with later or work with or who could help you with a certain problem or things like that you know so mm-hmm. it's a really nice sort of sort of easy easy way to chat when you're sitting and eating you know you're sharing yeah. a meal or something really sort of traditional and, and nice about it um awesome. and then yeah after the meal then we have the the drumming session and then we do our rock art by night walk with even lamb mm-hmm. so you met even the other day when we I were did. filming the the promo video and and she's a really fantastic woman she always makes me laugh she's got a really um really kind of dry sense of humor that mm-hmm. just it tickles me all the time <laughs> um but the the rock art walk is really cool so it's all lit by like firelight so mm-hmm. she's got like fire torches and mm-hmm. you walk down from the village through the field so there's this huge big sort of boulder in the middle of the field that i'm sure i walked past for like 12 years going to school I never even saw it Mm -hmm. but on it it's got all these rock art carvings (laughs) <laughs> and in the dark, you can use the torch to really highlight them. So you get to see them. And of course, uh, even is studying these for her master's. So she knows a huge amount about it. So she shares some of that information about wow. where they're from, maybe what they mean when they were made, that kind of stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So that's a really cool way to sort of conclude the evening, really. Yeah, and then, of course, awesome. we head to the pub afterwards, which everyone oh, really yeah, likes. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, I remember the last year was uh, was also dark sky uh, yeah kind of, we had an amazing dark sky walk last but year but it's it, I guess it's kind of always uh, the it's weather so, heavily weather dependent so weather dependent <laughs> we did have everyone remembers the dark sky walk from last year but we actually had a dark sky walk for the first two years as well mm-hmm. but um, I think they only saw the stars for about 10 minutes on the second year mm-hmm. and the first year it ended up um, being an indoor talk just because the weather just it let yeah. out on us it was pouring rain no you know you <laughs> no, wouldn't have no seen stars. any stars even if you dared to go outside <laughs> so we were sort of like yeah pulled mm. out of that one and Welcome. so we've we've given it a rest for this year mm-hmm. and then maybe next year the the weather gods yeah. will be in our favor and we'll we'll bring yeah. it back again yeah this is this is this is one of those things that anything else you can go in and, and kind of get soaking wet and it's gonna be fine with with a dark sky like whoa, you know if you can't actually, see the stars you're yeah, yeah it's like defeats the purpose <laughs> it's, it's tough you know and i think um our local dark sky group actually they're they're super knowledgeable they're a voluntary group and mm-hmm. they're like the work they do is really amazing um so the the indoor talks are really fascinating as well mm-hmm. But I I think we sort of made the call just based on it's already been a long day. You know, Mm -hmm. people don't really want to just head inside after the rock art by night to go and sit and listen to a talk. You know, it's sort of it's time to let the day go then, you know, and then sort of recoup ready for the next day. Yeah, because there's another day. Because there's (laughs) there's a whole other day, Tommy. Um, So Sunday this year, Mm -hmm. we have focused all of our workshops on citizen science. Oh. So That's they are all based on citizen science projects that are currently active in Ireland. Mm-hmm. So, so far I have confirmed with Per Search Ireland. So we have Sarah Varian from Marine mm-hmm. Dimensions, who's mm-hmm. been running the Per Search Ireland project for, I'd, I want to guess at nearly 10 years, mm-hmm. um, quite a while, um, maybe even more than that. So she's going to come down and do a workshop. So the Purse Search Ireland is all about the mermaid's purses that you find mm-hmm. washed up on the oh. beach. So yeah. they're the egg cases of skates mm-hmm. and rays. Um, and there's several different species around Ireland and some of them are in danger. Uh, some of them are endangered. So she is working on a research project looking at the endangered species and how we can help to monitor their mm-hmm. their nursery areas and yes. 
and protect their populations a little bit. Yes. Um, so you'll get to join in on a purse search and mm-hmm. learn a little bit about the skates and rays. Um, we have Dave Wall from the National Biodiversity Data Center. He's going to run the Explore Your Shore workshop, which is mm-hmm. a new initiative by the National Biodiversity Data Center to try and increase recording of marine animals, particularly coastal animals around mm-hmm. Ireland. Mm-hmm. So they've noticed in their data set that they have a lot of terrestrial species and not as much notice on the seashore. So this yeah. is their, their whole new um, program to get people engaged with the coast and and get them out and recording biodiversity on the coast as well. So he's going to run that workshop for us. Um, We've also got Clean Coasts are going to come down and they're Mm -hmm. going to do a workshop all around marine litter and the impact of it and how we can start to help. So you'll do a beach clean and then uh, sort of analyze the litter that you've found and then talk Mm -hmm. a little bit through the work that Clean Coasts do and how you can get involved yourself. Yes. Um, And then we're hoping to have a couple more, but I haven't had confirmation. So I'm... Mm -hmm. So it, it is. I don't it, want to start naming names and then they, yeah, sure. <laughs> they'll be going, Eleanor, you haven't spoken to me yet about that. So <laughs> I'll be like, surprise, guys, you're yeah. coming down as well. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, didn't you get the memo? So, so this is, you, you're still kind of working on it. You're still, you're still putting this together. Yeah, yeah. So the Sunday, I'm still waiting for a few workshops. The Saturday is pretty set and the Friday is all set as well. Okay. And then the Sunday, it's, it's just confirmation from a couple of people already. Sure, sure. And and to be honest, if if we don't get any extra workshops, I think mm-hmm. to run Citizen Science Sunday, we already have three amazing workshops. So, yeah, I don't, yeah we'll we'll run it as it is. Yeah, if we, if we, we don't not, get we if we don't get any extras, you know, do, yeah, 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 I think we'll, I think we'll be good. Um, on Sunday morning as well, I forgot to mention we were going to have a yoga session. We oh, hope. yeah, so a nice way to wake up and stretch out after your busy day on Saturday, and um, come and join us and do a little bit of yoga, and then be all ready to go for your workshop. Yeah, in case you you kind of been uh, ir- irresponsible <laughs> in the pub the day before, it's gonna be yeah. a good start <laughs> just just to get be you a in nice shape. Nice gentle start. To yeah, wake yeah, up. yeah, to yeah. get you in shape <laughs> into the rest of the day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. And then we we round up on Sunday mm-hmm. with the trip to church island so we we sort of have like a little debrief session after the workshops and that's just really to bring everyone together one last time and sort Mm -hmm. of you know say our thank yous and hopefully see you next year Mm -hmm. uh, and wish everyone a safe journey home and then uh, after lunch we do the trip to church island which is by boat and you meet even lamb out there and of course church island is the island in the middle of look quran where Mm -hmm. there is a church and a beehive hut and there's a load of history around it and Mm -hmm. even sort of interprets that for you while you're on the island so it's a really nice way to spend the afternoon if you've got time to stay and linger a bit a a little bit longer okay that's awesome so that's sunday that's sunday and monday monday Monday. so monday is monday is special because most of the most of most of people people will (laughs) just go back go back to the groove yeah most people have to go back to work on monday so i think monday is a little bit special um we like to do more of an adventure trip on the monday Mm -hmm. uh and it's really it's maybe not so much about prolonging the event as sort of prolonging the feeling of the event you know like just just to try and keep it going a little bit longer Mm -hmm. um you're doing that for yourself and it's it's Totally for me. And yeah. a few people like if, who are if actually... no one wants to come along, I'm fine to do it by myself, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> awesome. That's yeah awesome. i mean we we had an amazing time last year we kayaked across look mm-hmm. pulled the kayaks out at the end of the lake and hiked over the Kerry way over the windy gap into cara daniel and oh. finished the day then we had a lovely dinner in the blind piper pub in cara daniel yeah and then one of our friends picked us up and brought us home again so oh. just such a nice way after coming out of the weekend that sometimes can feel mm-hmm. like quite intensive mentally i suppose because you mm-hmm. are you know the old gray matter is getting stretched a little mm-hmm. bit with all all these new people and new yeah. ideas and what have you. So it's it's just a really nice way to sort of get out in the air, let everything settle, let everything sink in and, you know, come back to yourself a little bit. And okay. And is it like a, the f- full day on, on Monday as well? Yeah, it's it's about a five to six hour trip. So we okay. leave in the morning and we take our time. Okay. Yeah, would I'm, you, so I'm would not you recommend, the world's would... best hiker, so I like to walk really slowly. So if anyone's concerned about the pace, okay. be sure I'll be behind you probably <laughs> about 20 minutes. And, you know, I always do this thing and Lucy actually said this to me and it made me laugh so hard. She, she she has done a ton of hiking. Like she's climbed mm. Kilimanjaro. Mm. She's been up and down Carantula in all mm. weathers. And she's constantly saying this when she's halfway through a hike. Mm. She has this moment where she's like, 
do I even like hiking? <laughs> like, why do I do this to myself? Do I, am I enjoying this? Do I, do I like this? And I, like, oh, I was man. like, I feel that. I really feel that <laughs> because I'm one of those people who's all like, oh yeah, I can do it. No problem. I get halfway through something. I'm like, I'd like to lie down again. <laughs> like if we could take a nap break in the middle, I'd be happy with that. So. I, I, I understand that totally. I have this this year with cycling, you know, <laughs> I was, I was cycling and I was like, why am I doing that to myself? <laughs> and I don't know, like, it was strange. And I, and I said it to a couple of guys who were, you know, in a cycling club and they're kind of cyclists. And they looked at me like, you know, with this look on their face, like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, honestly. And look, I, I, like in my days, I cycled like an insane amount of kilometers. And something was like, like, you know, it was almost like a feeling it's taking too long, but because, you know, like a good cycle, it's it's anything between five and eight hours, right? It's a good cycle. And I was like, oh, it's, like it's taking so long. And it's like, am I enjoying? And obviously, you know, after two hours, you're kind of getting in a, in a flow and you just do it. And at some point I, I stopped in the middle of a season because I said, like, I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> Like I, I can't I can't make like another job out of this that I have yeah. to go cycle my hundred kilometers today. Like no. <laughs> so I totally understand yeah. that this can happen and then probably you need to take a, like a year off and then go back at it and we're gonna be all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think as well it's that um I suppose you I don't do a ton of hiking. So mm -hmm. it's that feeling where you're like, you're going up the mountain. So you, mm -hmm. you obviously have to climb the mountain first before mm -hmm. you can enjoy the walk down the other side. <laughs> and, and like, that's the part I struggle with is that you're, you're halfway really? up and you're like, I'm not even halfway up yet. I'm about to die. Like, oh my gosh, I need to get fitter. Why did I do this? I didn't eat enough breakfast. I should have brought more food. You know, like all of these thoughts in my head. And then you get to the top and you're mm -hmm. obviously with this amazing like vista out mm -hmm. in front of you. And, you know, the sun breaks through the cloud at the perfect moment and shines and down on you. And you're just like, oh, this is the most amazing day I've ever had. And you totally forget, you know, the yeah. 20 minutes hard slog you yeah, just did, yeah, like, yeah. you know, fighting the mental battle with yourself. <laughs> but I think it's always worth it at the end. But mm -hmm. sometimes in the middle, for sure, I'm yeah. second guessing my decisions. <laughs> but, but, you know, but you're in a better situation because you, you mentioned you like coming down. Oh, yeah. And I don't. <laughs> like, I actually, when I'm hiking, so with me and hiking, it's like, number one, I probably uh, not probably I don't like hiking for hiking's sake. I need to I need to have a goal. Like just get up there is not good enough goal. Like I need to have some some well, great, but what are we doing? What yes, are we doing yes, up there? Some, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like I'm not going to go to Spain, right? I I went to Spain to fish for catfish on Ebro. Okay, I know what I'm going to Spain. I have a goal. Right? I have a, there's a mission, right? But just just go to Spain is like nah not interested and this is like with hiking with me like oh let's let's hike up the up the mountain like why like is it like i'm just as happy sitting here for the day <laughs> yeah yeah like if, if you tell me there's a goal like we're gonna photograph something or you know there's a deer or just like something I, yeah okay i know what i'm doing this but then when i'm doing this and i quite quite often doing that just for the sake of hiking obviously it's social event quite often i like the way up it's challenging. It, 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 you're putting an effort. I'm going in. So I'm kind of finding the goal of that hike in the effort of hiking up, right? And then once I'm hiked up and I'm up at the mountain, it's like, okay, I'm done. Now I have to, <laughs> now I have to come down. Oh, no, no. If someone just, you know, helicopter just lifts teleport me you the, back yeah, down yeah, again. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, well, I did the hard bit. I'm done. I'm exactly, done. Exactly. We should just get a little, you know, like a dog sled or something, and you can hike up and I'll sit on the sled. <laughs> yes. And then I'll do the downwards bit, and you, <laughs> and you can just sit down and sit it out. It'll be fun. Yeah, It'll be a great get, team. I just, I just get in the sled and just, just hammer down the slope. <laughs> There you go. That's well, if you need a goal for Monday, a yeah. really nice pint of Guinness in the Blind Piper is always the thing that gets me going. So the, oh, okay. the first time we did... But we, you need to do up and yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. I have to do the up <laughs> and the down, but like it's worth it. And the first time we did this walk, we did like a recce trip. So there was uh -huh. Lucy, Damien, myself, mm -hmm. and Lucy's cousin, William, and my brother. And the five of us set off and mm -hmm. we hiked across the lake and we mm -hmm. I died on the way up the mountain and finally made it down. And I have not ever been in my mm -hmm. life a Guinness drinker. Mm -hmm. 
and we got into the bar and I looked like someone who'd been dragged from hell like I was just done in <laughs> and everyone's like you okay Eleanor and I'm like no there's nothing about me that's okay like my my feet are like I don't even know what they're doing my legs are aching and then Lucy goes oh here have a pint of Guinness and I drank the pint of Guinness Ta-da. and in that moment I was just like Guinness is the most amazing thing in the world <laughs> and since then if I've done uh, like a hard hike I'm like well where's the pint of Guinness yeah. now like like that's all that's in it for me like <laughs> never mind your goal to get to the top Tommy like it's the it's the pint it's the only time it's the only time I drink Guinness is when I'm actually done with a long hike yeah. and I'm like well that's it my reward now can be yeah you're 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 become I'm a Guinness drinker <laughs> with the hiking problem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. So just just one more time. Uh, what are the dates and how to get the tickets? Okay. So the dates are Friday the 11th through to Sunday. Oh, sorry. Till Monday the mm. 14th. Mm. Uh, so Monday is the great adventure trip that we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Friday, it starts in the evening. So you should have time to finish up work and get down. Yes. Or, you know, take a holiday day. Like people work too much anyway. So yeah. come and join us from Friday straight through to Monday. Mm-hmm. The tickets are available for sale on eventbrite.ie. So mm-hmm. if you just go on and search Eva Learning Landscapes, you should be able to find the event then. And there's a selection of tickets. So you can get an adult ticket. You can get a family ticket. You can buy a ticket if there's just one workshop that you really want to go to. You can buy a one workshop pass. Oh. So you can just come to that wow. one workshop that you're really desperate to go to. Um, and then we do uh, a kid's ticket. So if it's just you and your son or daughter coming, you only need to buy the adult ticket and the kid's ticket. And it's mm-hmm. cheaper than the family ticket. So okay. it sort of works out cost effective for everybody. Wow. Um, we're That's also smart. on Facebook. I've, I've put a lot of thought into it. Actually, yeah. I lie. I've had a lot of input from people who do yeah. ticketing stuff. Um, yeah. And a lot of friends sort of making suggestions that has helped but evolve how, the ticket look, process. This is, how, that's, this is how you're getting the <laughs> yeah. best result, right? You hear people and they're like, wow, that's, that's yeah, smart. It's, it's been a learning process. Um, and then so for the Friday night talks as well, if you mm-hmm. can't make the whole weekend and you just feel like you want to sit in mm-hmm. on the talks, you can just pay at the door and join us for the evening. And okay. that's that's grand too. Um we really just like the idea of people sort of connecting together. So yes. yeah, you know, we're not, we're not profit driven. We're not really yeah. interested in selling huge numbers of tickets. What mm-hmm. we really want is to have this event be something that people enjoy. So, yes. you know, we're trying to make it as accessible for people as possible. And we do have a Facebook page and an Instagram account. So we often post um, sort of workshop bios and different mm-hmm. different sort of aspects of the event to give you an introduction to what's going to happen over the weekend. Mm-hmm. So you can follow those pages mm-hmm. and sort of keep up to date with things as they develop. Yeah. Twitter, not Twitter. Not uh, Twitter yet. No, there I, is a Twitter. Actually, there is a Twitter, Twitter account, skills. but it's, it's kind of like <laughs> <laughs> that is a testament to my social media management. That there, Tommy. Uh, I very industriously set up a Twitter account, and I've not tweeted not once. <laughs> yes, from I it. know. <laughs> I was just hoping no one searches for it on Twitter. Don't search Twitter. Go to Instagram. It was the, it was I'm, the first I'm, thing I'm I having searched. an Instagram moment. Like I really like Instagram at the minute, so a lot of stuff gets on Instagram. Oh, Instagram is very much then, like like <laughs> on the up right now. A lot yeah. of yeah, uh, I, just, I just really enjoy it. I don't know yeah. why I find it so simple, but yeah, yeah it's it's just click. I never, you know, moment. I never used Facebook. Never ever had a. I I, I started Facebook page with for the podcast. Mm-hmm. So I have a Facebook page for the podcast, but I never. And I look at Facebook. It's like, why why are people even using this? It's like <laughs> I I'm not I'm not surprised. It like to me the website looks like a website from the early 2000s. Still kind of like a clunky. And, uh, and I, I'm not surprised that the you're, new, you're new generation... More, you're much more tech savvy than some people though, Tommy. But, but I mean, like <laughs> new generation doesn't use Facebook and I'm not blaming them. I, I reckon that only people who are using Facebook are people who are stuck using Facebook, which I'm now, I'm one of them because... <laughs> because I'm <laughs> welcome, welcome to the dark side. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I actually find Facebook pretty handy in that it's almost like a free web page. So mm-hmm. for, for example, for yeah. Ivra Learning Landscapes, it gives us that capacity to have a lot of information in one space so if people want to find out more details it's very easy to set up a Facebook page and have the details posted there it's also very easy when you have someone like our wonderful Ashling who is Mm -hmm. doing the Facebook posts for me and I don't Ah. have to think about it Um, (laughs) another shout out to Ashling there Um, very good yeah so that that gets updated quite regularly and it is it's it's kind of an easy point of call for people so if they have a question or if they just want to send a quick message you can message us on Facebook and we can get back to you that's no doubt that's no doubt from the 
you know, usability standpoint like well yeah, yeah. you can you can That's argue it. with that but yeah know. like i said now the instagram's kind of my my moment at the, no. at the minute so I'm, I'm sort of putting a few bits on the instagram page and if you want a message on the instagram page i'll get back to you as well so awesome yeah ellie any questions you. direct them this way and buy your ticket absolutely thank <laughs> you very much thanks tommy